Здравствуйте, меня зовут Анджи Баранова, я профессор школы системной биологии в университете Джорджа Мейсона в США. Center, where we'll be talking about uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is changing the uh, world in front of us. So, um, some consequences of this um, can only be predicted. But now, let us focus on uh, just certain uh, trends. Uh, let us focus on some uh, data. Um, on SARS and try to understand the repercussions of the epidemic uh, for society and our patients. We will talk about the visible and visi uh, invisible consequences of the uh, infection with uh, patients of diagnosed and undiagnosed um, oncological diseases. And of course, we uh, shouldn't forget about patients that are likely to uh, develop um, oncological diseases, are likely to develop cancer. Um, it's a very frequent occurrence. Um, as far as skin lesions are concerned, as far as skin lesions are concerned, as uh, the um, uh, um, this is very frequent, but I'm talking about leukosis or solid tumors. There are two categories of patients that can be impacted by the coronavirus uh, infection. The first category of these patients are the patients undergoing chemotherapy. The second category are patients on remission that have undergone chemotherapy and are not receiving it at the moment. These are two very different categories in terms of the risk um, of coronavirus infection. The first category, receiving treatment on treatment patients, um, emerged in mid-February. Um, it's a category um, that was reported in China. However, the, uh, the, um, the study was specialized in Lancet oncology, even though the sample was small, because uh, the study was so important. It assessed the risk factors of uh, severe coronavirus infection. Um, so um, many severe sequelae um, complications were studied. Um, along with well-known uh, risk factors such as uh, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and uh, even cold. The risk of patients uh, undergoing chemotherapy if they contract coronavirus, uh, the risk of um, serious um, damage to health is quite high. The study was followed by other larger works with larger samples of patients. More than one aspect of the coronavirus disease was considered. At present, this is a preprint of one of the um, uh, articles that studied um, over 200 patients with uh, primary bre uh, breast cancer. Cancer. Um, they were divided into two groups: uh, one receiving chemotherapy, the other uh, currently on remission. And the two groups uh, markedly differ in terms of uh, death rate to coronavirus. Look at the Kaplan-Meier curves. The blue line shows the patients on remission. The mortality rate uh, to coronavirus is um, about the same as for the general uh, population with adjustments to age and underlying diseases. However, patients on chemotherapy um, are very likely to um, be affected by the coronavirus. The death rate is very high. These two groups. One, as the patients currently receiving treatment and post-treatment patients, um, they're not just option A or option B. Of course, there is a gray area between them, and this gray zone is determined by the um, 
length of time since chemotherapy. Um, we have a study that we conducted um, on uh, uh, patients um, that received chemotherapy for primary for primary breast cancer, we collected blood samples, and um, uh, they were analyzed by uh, pseudofluorimetry. Um, we identified uh, the um, immunosuppressive um, effect, which continued of up to nine months after chemotherapy. Uh, so the um, immune um, function is suboptimal. So what happens over the nine months period uh, is just something that we don't know. On many parameters, such as um, memory cells, T memory cells, uh, could uh, restore themselves. However, the B cells remained very low. Uh, and even nine mon uh, months after chemotherapy, they were significantly lower compared to the beginning, the um, level at the beginning of chemotherapy. Um, the patients also <coughs> lost their antibodies for anti-tetanus um, immunization um, and remain suboptimal nine months after chemotherapy. So the immune system did not fully recover. Of course, we need to um, carefully study the patients on remission, the patients who um, uh, compared to patients in um, compared to patients on treatment, uh, the risk group is uh, patients with lymph proliferative diseases. Uh, they ha have a higher chance of uh, contracting coronavirus and of dying of coronavirus. Um, so patients with solid tumors on therapy. Um, uh, the death rate um, in that group is 18 percent. Uh, however, uh, as far as lymphoma uh, and uh, leukosis patients are concerned, they must take special care um, against coronavirus. Uh, vaccination to um, patients with cancers is much more important compared to uh, general population. We don't have the vaccine, but we do have um, data on a flu pro vaccine uh, with huge statistics. As far as the flu vaccine is concerned, a major study with 26,000 patients with cancer on remission who were vaccinated against flu in Canada in two seasons. Um, Uh, to make sure uh, to to eliminate the seasonal factor, to eliminate the year factor, uh, the patients were tested in 2015 and 2016, and uh, the number of patients who contracted flu in uh, both groups was um, compared with adjustments for uh, age, underlying disease, activity levels. Uh, the work was published in Clinical Oncology in 2019. It showed that uh, patients with uh, solid tumors on remission um, showed uh, the 25 percent uh, vaccination efficiency level. So for 75 percent of the patients, uh, the vaccine was not effective. As far as leukosis is concerned, um, the um, vaccine resulted in just 8% efficiency. So the vast majority was not protected by the vaccine. The new coronavirus vaccine, um, whatever it is, must be tested specifically on patients with remission after they have been diagnosed with cancer and after they have undergone chemotherapy, paying particular attention to patients with lymphomas. In this group, vaccination did not result in immune response. And moreover, in case of flu, inactivated uh, vaccine um, has some 
uh, chances to succeed. Inact uh, activated vaccine um, is inappropriate because it can cause the disease itself in, um, in patients. It can induce disease rather than prevent it. Moreover, we have additional risks to patients who are receiving treatment at the moment. However, the key um, of these risks are reflected um, in uh, among the risks that we have uh, um, seen before. Um, uh, high risk um, resulting from immune suppression. Um, steroid medications and other immune suppressive uh, agents can um, um, have a detrimental effect. Um, medical staff uh, can sometimes transmit coronavirus, so um, the um, attendance of healthcare institutions is a risk factor. Um, the uh, patients on treatment. Uh, have a higher death rate to infection. And the patients have also a higher risk to, uh, of uh, dying without uh, being identified as coronavirus patients because the coronavirus um, infection is just a concomital um, infection that accompanies either cancer or uh, interstitial syndrome. In addition to the risks that I have just named, we have a number of invisible risks, indirect risks, that must be assessed, uh, even though they may be of minor importance compared to every individual. Uh, they are of tremendous significance to public health, because there are patients on remission who um, skip uh, planned um, uh, follow-up visits. So on the population level, uh, we may be uh, heading towards a delayed um, surge of oncological diseases uh, because, uh, for example, to um, get tested for PSA, um, the patients will, uh, will not visit healthcare facilities um, uh, to get tested for PSA. Other risk groups may include elderly uh, patients, for example, who um, delay certain um, prevention, prophylactic activities such as colonoscopy. So because uh, patients out of fear of infection skip those um, um, important visits, we can also uh, be heading for um, a later surge of cancer after the uh, coronavirus epidemic has resolved. Also, there are invisible risks. Across the world, um, clinical trials are ongoing for um, anti-cancer medications. However, due to uh, the lockdown measures, Patients are more reluctant to get enrolled in clinical trials. Or sometimes also may skip their regular visits and may be lost to the clinical um, trial environment. And that means that uh, the clinical trials may either, uh, either be suspended or frozen. Um, and this may result um, in uh, clinical trial data being less valid. So patients that were affected by coronavirus or patients that skipped their regular visits and um, broke the protocol, they may be censored from the clinical trial data set, which uh, means that the uh, data are going to be poorer for it. A number of clinical trials have been stopped, even though uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, fight to the death to prevent this from happening. Um, clinical trials are another variable uh, factors that uh, may be 
that may require um, so if the patients are uh, drop out from clinical trials, um, they may be um, lost to the uh, clinical trial data set. And of course, this will have some impact on the data quality, on medication price. However, there are benefits to the situation too, because um, uh, in, uh, uh, medica uh, in many cases, um, protocols are developed for uh, um, Uh, for uh, clinical trial uh, procedures in uh, lockdown settings. At present, these technologies um, are likely to flourish, they're likely to thrive, and those patients who um, still find it in themselves to um, volunteer for clinical trials are especially valuable. However, many people will be giving up the uh, clinical trials because um, uh, uh, because of the necessity to travel to the clinical centers. Okay, so um, I will be happy to take your questions if you have any.